All right. Um, so my presentation is based off my walk fit course that I'm teaching right now and leading and going through this entire semester. I'm pretty sure y'all heard a little bit about it, but <laughs> here's just some bullet points. Walk fit is a exercise class that meets three days a week and we exercise for 30 minutes, um, mostly walking and then a few exercise stops. So about four to six exercise stops along the way and we cover a variety of distances. Um, usually it's always over a mile and we, re we reached a little over two miles one day but we were tied over 30 minutes so we tried to keep it to where we're always back in 30 minutes. So anyways, it's funded by Blue Cross Blue Shield. Um, I have about 15 students every class period. Today was abnormally low. We only had five participants and one day we had about 75 and Karen was there that day. It was really fun. We had, yeah, yeah, we got a few shirts. We had visors. Um, it was a huge thing. And I felt so empowered leading um, about 75 people in exercises. And we just did all sorts of fun stuff. So that was awesome. Um, but that was just a one-time thing because it was promoted on the Sanderson website and whatnot. So that was fun. <laughs> but anyways, um, I also try to incorporate some other domains, not just all psychomotor activities. We do conversations about health and fitness and wellness, and I try to encourage them to walk with each other on other days of the week, on Tuesdays and Fridays, and maybe over the weekend. And I try to encourage um, them to just understand that this is a type, this is an opportunity for um, conversations, social interactions. It's all. It's more about fun and activity all at the same time, not just walking um, with headphones in. And I try to discourage headphone use during my walk fit course. Oh. Um, so cognitive portion and in the introduction, I really like to tell why we're doing the activities. The very first day, I told everybody, now um, it's recommended from the CDC for um, 30 minutes of physical activity, 30 to 30 to 60 minutes of moderate to vigorous activity, um, three to five days a week, or 90 minutes a week if you're, um, you know, moderate to vigorous 90 minutes a week is the recommended. So if I lead three days, then that's reaching the recommendation. So it just depends on if they come all three days. So I tried to talk about some kind of standards for physical activity, and I also and I also teach muscle groups, so when we do squats, you know, I'll say we're working our quadriceps. When we're doing lunges, we're doing some um, hamstring activities. When we're doing toe touches and whatnot, we're working our gastrocnemius. We'll do push-ups, and I'll talk about the deltoids, triceps. Um, we'll do extensions. We'll do step-ups. So I'm also teaching information about the muscle groups that we're um, currently engaging in at each activity. Um, and then, so like, okay, so I basically just covered, that's the point of that slide, is I cover more than just physical activity. <laughs> so, okay, we got that. Next are my research questions. So I have two. The first one is my original thought process for um, my research design task, which I submitted, you know, as my design. But then I added on this extra one for recently, just last week, um, to spring off of my current research that I presented over the weekend at the graduate student symposium and that's lifetime wellness. So I'm um, kind of combining both projects together. My first one is will the students participating in the walk fit course have the knowledge and the literacy to create their own fitness plan um, and it's going to be based off my rubric and that's I'm going to show you in a few slides. The next exercise question is after the students complete this walk fit course will they have um, will they be motivated and prepared and competent which is important to live a lifetime of physical activity um, by the teaching methods of the instructor, so me or another teacher um, teaching the physical activity. So I'm going to link the two of those together so we got the knowledge and comprehension and literacy and movement and why it's important. And then is that actually going to propel them for physical activity for a lifetime or is it just great information that's going to go in their head and then leave? So those are my two, pro those are my two questions that are driving this design project. So my participants are going to be, obviously, whoever gives consent to be a part of the research study. I have school age all the way up through adult. So if I was doing this project in a physical education course, which I could potentially be doing next year when, if I'm working on my PhD, I could pr use this as a research project, maybe a dissertation, since I'm going to have longitudinal data. Um, we'll talk about that in a minute. So anyways, middle school, high school, or adults, it doesn't matter. It's really just anybody that could be a part of the um, part of the design. And so it could be walk fit, aerobics, a spin course, um, physical education, etc. Methods. So a four month class or semester class. So four month is my walk fit design. So that's why I added four months. So the 
class is going to create their own exercise plan. And that's going to be done during the last class session. Um, do the last class session. So we're going to talk about it and everything, but that's when I would collect the um, exercise plan that they're going to create. And there's also, okay, so we'll talk about the rubric. So the next is the question number two, the lifetime participation. So a follow-up phone call or email after one year, two year, and three years um, conclusion of the course. Um, numbers and emails obviously obtained during the consent. Um, after going through IRB, I realized that you have to do a lot of consent. And you have to really detail everything, so I'm just kind of used to typing that in. So I put it in, I was like, they probably don't care. But anyways, <laughs> <laughs> analysis, how I'm going to an analyze this data and see if there's any correlation or um, if it's going to present more lifetime activity is, okay, so the exercise plan is based off the rubric. Lifetime participation is off the phone call. We'll talk about how I'm going to measure both those in a minute. The two an uh, variables are going to be analyzed using t-test. Got that correct? Statistics. Okay. Um, and then I'm going to see if there's a correlation between a positive and a, um, the next slide obviously I need to talk about that, a uh, participation and your exercise plan. So if, okay, anyways, an overall percent of lifetime in a trend line. So after year one, year two, year three, is there a trend is increasing, keeping the same, or decreasing? And then a percent, 100% of the students um, had lifetime participation, maybe 50%, 20%, I don't know what the number would be. So an overall percentage, trend line, and a correlation between lifetime activities and the exercise plan are the variables that I'm trying to collect for my analysis. So design continues. So the purpose, obviously, is to see if there's, a stati if there's statistical significance between lifetime participation and creating your own exercise plan. And um, do they have the, per the information, the skills that they need to do this? The hypothesis, obviously, students are prepared um, by creating a quality exercise plan. And quality at the bottom is described to have a score above 78%, so 11 or more of the 14 criteria. And then a poor exercise plan. So those that do have, have a poor exercise plan uh, be less likely to participate in lifetime fitness and activity. And those with a quality exercise plan, um, hypothesizing that they're going to have more chance of more... Um, they'll probably, they'll be more prepared. Yeah, probability, yeah. So that's my hypothesis. So next is my exercise plan rubric. So like I said in the last one, 11 plus to 14 would be, um, you know, quality plan. So that's, so I have unacceptable, that's probably, that's not giving her no information. Acceptable, missing some things, and target. So the, ex so the um, criteria is selection of exercise. You need to have um, eight plus exercises. We have frequency, how often are you going to be um, going into this exercise plan, the frequency of the activity. So we have frequencies for all eight of the activities, okay? So if you're going to choose lunges, then we need to know how far or how many you're going to be doing. Intensity, how hard are you going to be doing them? There's a very various ways that you can measure intensity. We can do heart rate, we can do with weights, without weights. Are we doing lunges holding 20 pound dumbbells? That's going to be a lot harder. Or are we just going to be doing free weight that can add intensity? Duration slash time, so um, you can measure the exercise using one of the two of those, and we need that for all the exercises as well. Um, if you're going to be running a mile once a week, how, um, how, long, how long is it going to take you normally? Or if we're going to be running, <coughs> if we're going to be just running for 10 minutes, then that's a good time, okay? So that's two different ways that you can measure it. Now, resources slash equipment. So I need all my students to understand what they're going to need before they develop a fitness plan because every single thing matters. Are we going to have tennis shoes or are we going to be in heels? Are we going to have exercise attire? Do we need dumbbells? Do we need medicine balls? Do we need exercise yoga mat? Do we need, um, do we need a bike? Do we need uh, access to a pool for swimming facilities? Um, do we need a gym membership? So there's all sorts of things that I need them to understand that they need. Four is minimal because I just it, just in case the participants don't have access to a pool or equipment. Four things that you can name is exercise clothing, shoes, and you need um, some sunglasses or something to go outside, and then maybe you'll need a cell phone for a timer, okay, because you want to time yourself. So it can be very minimal, but I need them to describe what resources they need in their exercise plan. Personal goals, this is important because we need to have goals to drive what we're going to be doing. So it has to be reasonably obtainable and measurable. That's one thing because um, someone might say, I'm 500 pounds and I want to be 200 or 100 pounds in two months or something ridiculous, you know? <laughs> I don't know, but it has to be reasonably obtainable and measurable. 
and that's important for a fitness goal. And progression, we need to have progression. So you need to be getting better. We don't need to be stagnant in our fitness and just stay there forever. We need to always be progressing and if, that's, if that is working in their program. Um, but it needs to be reasonably obtainable, again, and promote strength gains and fitness. So this is my exercise plan. The next is a lifetime participation follow-up, one, two, three years, categorized between least active and most active. And this is taken off of study. I'll describe, I'll describe in a few slides. And the follow-up questionnaire, basically, um, it's are you participating? What's going on in your, uh, what's going on in your world? The most important bullet point is this one right here. Can you give me a seven-day physical activity recap to the best of your knowledge? Um, and that will kind of let you know this is what they did within seven days, and you can kind of average that and say this is how their normal weeks are going. Um, but there's some other questions you could ask as well. So that's my design task and what I'm planning on doing, if, it, if I can. And the next I'll go through all my different, I have five, um, five research to show you. First one is, okay, so this is when there is intervention between health fitness knowledge and they're measuring the difference between physical activity rates in physical education classes and integrating more health knowledge. So um, all this is based around increasing the knowledge in your students, which is my question number one. Are they gonna have the knowledge to be able to do this? So in this, we had a whole bunch, we had five, 10 different schools, five and five, and one of them was the, one of them was the KIA fitness lessons, so that was knowledge in action, and the other one was a um, intervention group and then the comparison group. So there wasn't a statistical significance between, but 22% higher improvements in fitness, in fitness knowledge in, um, and higher levels of fitness knowledge and higher levels of activity in the intervention group. So the point of it was, that increasing your fitness knowledge does not take away from the amount of physical activity in your classes. Mm -hmm. And that I think is really important because a lot of teachers will say, I want them moving, I don't want to do worksheets and sit there. Um, you can totally teach a lot of stuff while moving. You could do stations, they could be working around, they could be doing, um, teaching each other activities, they could be doing relay races and all sorts of fun stuff that's outlined in this project, in this research that I'm talking about. Um, I can't describe them all, but there's a lot of fun activities that they did that incorporated higher amounts of vigorous activity and increasing fitness knowledge at the exact same time. So I thought that was valuable information to keep in, to put in my slideshow. The next is health-related fitness knowledge and physical activity in high school students. This one is where I'm going to pick, where, I'm, where I would gather the scale one least active to five most active for my assessment of lifelong participation, and that's also where I pulled the seven-day recap of physical activity. It's off of this study, which is based off of other previous studies, so it's just really nice when you're doing research to make sure that your questions and your analysis is validated. If not, then it's less likely for your research to get published. So that's why I would put this one in here. It's a 100-item um, health questionnaire, and these students failed. It said the average score was like 30% on their cognitive questions, and it showed all 100 of the questions, and some of them I was like, I don't really know. Um, so that was interesting, but there was, there was a significance between health fitness knowledge and the amount of physical activity. So I thought that was really valuable information, because the more you know about health, the more likely you are to be physically active. So I think it's important how this fits is um, a common bullet point I have this in all my slides is I think it's important to incorporate a lot of fitness knowledge in the classroom so they can understand and this study just kind of backs me up and says that those with the higher fitness knowledge scored better on the test are significantly um, more amped to do physical activity or to be physically active. So that was a, it's a pretty good study. It only had 167 students but I still think it's a reasonable um, representation of the population. All right, so third, I put in some outcomes. Um, I don't know if a lot of you know, but there is outcomes for physical education, and this is how we're supposed to be driving our curriculums and how we're supposed to be teaching. Now, it's 300 page document or so, and it, it has every single grade from kindergarten up to 12th grade, and every single standard, and every single movement literacy, and every single expectation for your class. For example, I have S1E25, which is standard number one, the physically competent individual has the movement skills and literacy um, for uh, 
participating in games and activities. And then E2 is outcome two. And then how it says E, that means it's elementary. Mm. So it's the elementary outcome.